Sir, could you start with your name and your job title, please? Um, this is Abhishek Mukherjee. I am the editor at Cricket News. And you've also written a book. So you can, while, while we're here, why don't you say the name of the book and your co-author, who is not here? Um, this is Sachin and Azhar at Cape Town. I've written this with Arunava Sengupta, who is in Netherlands. And that is where we were while we co-authored this book. And uh, I, I was in India and he was in Netherlands when we co-authored the book. Beautiful. Uh, I think a lot of people will be very interested in this book because of the Azaruddin angle. I mean, it's basically a book about Sachin Tendulkar, Nelson Mandela, and um, Muhammad Azaruddin, and, you know, spot the odd one out in those three. Um, why, what, what, what sort of drove you two to write the book in the first place? Okay, uh, the first thing is, I think there are, the, the entire history of cricket as we know it is written from a very Anglo-Australian perspective. I mean, uh, if you ask cricket writers, cricket historians to list the greatest matches, greatest performance, Almost all of them involve at least one of Australia and England. At least one, if not both. So, uh, this has, this one completely passed under the radar. I, I don't know why exactly, because this was a very unlikely partnership. Unlikely in many ways. First, say, uh, India were uh, bowled out for 166, not 166. 100 in the first innings and 66 in the second innings at Durban. They lost by over 300 runs. Here, South Africa put up over 500. India were 58 for 5. This innings was not supposed to happen. I mean, this was not on the cards. And then, when we discuss the greatest innings, the greatest partnerships, it is typically, it typically involves uh, a long rear guard axe. We have seen the Dravid Lakshman stands. We have seen a couple of them. So they lasted over a day. This one lasted just around two hours or thereabouts. And uh, typically it's attack at one end and defense at the other. But this was attack at both ends. The bowlers, five bowlers, all of them averaged below, tw below 30 in test cricket. Donald and Donald was at his peak. Pollock was had just been was just establishing himself as his uh, partner. Klusner was just coming uh, uh, off uh, an eight wicket haul on Test debut. McMillan had been there, and Paul Adams has the has a better record against India than Shane Warne. So this was the bowling attack. As as I said, if uh, when we talk about famous partnerships in test cricket, a sustained long partnership, it is typically attack from one end, defense from the other, or sustained attack from both ends. This was uninhibited attack from both ends. And it was relentless. It went on. I mean, 200 or runs are thereabouts in one session. 222 run partnership in about 40 overs against that kind of attack. In Cape Town, I don't think uh, there is a parallel in all these years of Test cricket, but it passed under the radar. I, I mean, you saw uh, just around a year later um, Atherton's performance. Hmm. That I mean, we have seen. Uh, you just search on the internet, and there will be fifty pieces on that alone. So, but there's nothing on this one, probably because of the result. But again, uh, there was no, there was very little coverage. One of the reasons that there was very little coverage was uh, this one. This innings came at a very strange juncture between uh, print era and the internet era. So the internet era of cricket journalism was just about taking off. Yeah. So whatever reports you'll find about uh, from the of this match or this period are very basic on the internet, whatever you'll find. But, uh, yeah, the, the other thing is, cable television in India, 
that came in the early 1990s until the early 1990s what whatever cricket the indians got to see whatever test cricket the indians got to see live was from asia outside asia india toured their first major tour since proper cable television came across the country was one test kapil dev's last test in uh, 1994 after that the first full length series india got to see was in 1996 in england and then there was this one so uh, basically there was this other thing we actually got to see this test match live but we were surprised that no one really wrote as much i mean this was an innings a partnership waiting to be written about that is another thing and then i mean there are many reasons and then uh, 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 india and south africa if you look at the two countries india opened up globally as a financial i mean india globalization happened in india roughly at the same time when south africa also opened up to the world so the two countries i won't say grew together but there was a common starting point in their growth yeah so that is another thing yeah i mean the, the whole thing's really interesting also I, one of the other things i was thinking about is that mohammad azharuddin is famous for being a match fixer and his role in that but if you grew up in the 80s and 90s like we did uh he was famous for being you know incredibly elegant and you know you the, your book's got some incredible moments like um Lance Klusner compares him to Steve Smith in his ability to hit the ball you know anywhere on the leg side uh from outside off stump but as I could also play the same ball out on the offside yeah. uh brilliantly as well and was you know compared to Steve Smith uh graceful i think in I think in the book you might say he plays ungrammatical shots on the offside but i always loved his shots on the offside as well they were his own he was for a long time one of the best batters in the world in what was not a particularly great era for batting yeah i mean azhar uh, came in came to in azhar the problem with azhar is he often had this long string of poor scores low scores especially overseas and suddenly he uh, see he was not a great uh, he doesn't have a great record against fast bowling but here uh, india lost the test match in ahmedabad then azhar came out and scored 100 and a 50 in calcutta in the next test he scores 100 in kanpur he fails in durban but again he scores 100 in cape town so that is 300s in four test matches against south africa and then suddenly he again loses form so this is one of the things one of the problems azhar had he when he got runs he got them in bunches of 300 400s even 500s and then he suddenly inexplicably lost form again for a couple of years so either you remember him at his peak or you remember him for the rest of his career that is how we typically but see azhar fans of the era agree on one thing that he was probably not an all time great they will be the first to agree agree to that but then again uh, he was a different kind of uh, what do you say he was a different kind of batter to view when he was on song nobody matched him mm. there were some shots that only he could play yeah i mean when you say he wasn't an all time great if i remember from your book wasn't there a three three or four year period where he only played one test at home yeah so Azhar, I mean, uh, I mean, it's it's that's where you make all your runs. <laughs> yeah. So basically, in in uh, Azhar didn't Azhar, and it's almost a fairy tale. So Azhar uh, from he scores three hundreds on Test debut, uh, in his first three Test matches. So that's still a world record. And then over the next four five years, he just scores one more te- one more Test hundred. So India tours Pakistan in end of nineteen eighty nine. Azhar was all Azhar is all set to be dropped from the test squad from the test 11 uh, on the on the morning of the test match raman lamba injures a finger azhar plays and azhar is included at the last moment not long not long before the toss so azhar gets a chance he he scores 35 in each innings and but he takes five catches in the next test match he scores 100 india 
That's a four test match series as a, and Azhar keeps his place. So it's a 0-0 draw. India returns from Pakistan. Srikant was captain. Srikant is sacked after the test series. Raj Singh Dungarpur uh, of BCCI goes up to Azhar and uh, asks Azhar during a dom domestic match, will you become captain of India? And Azhar at that point had led in, on led in only four first class matches. So with that kind of experience, Azhar is named captain of India. And Azhar's first tour is of New Zealand, then England, then Australia, then South Africa. In between all this, he gets to play or gets to lead only again, only in one home test against Sri Lanka at home. That is against the weakest side. So uh, while leading uh, in the first two, in the first three years of captaincy, Azhar gets only one home test. Ten years later, Ganguly is appointed captain. Ganguly gets uh, starts with a series in uh, starts starts with a test match in Bangladesh. And then he leads four tests across two series against Zimbabwe and then a series in Zimbabwe. So it is, it often depends on how you start. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, there's some other things I found really fascinating from his career. One that I had noticed specifically was that later in his career, he scored a lot quicker. And we see most test yes. batters get slower because they basically eradicate any shots where they can ever be dismissed so that no one can abuse them in newspapers, right? And to, to do the opposite of that, I, I wonder if you could even do that in this era or if that's something that anyone would do in modern times. Um, but but I, I just wonder if, if, if something changed in his, in his mindset the way he went after test attacks in the 90s compared to the 80s. I don't know. I mean, why? Uh, it made no sense because the moment he start, the attacks got better, he started scoring quicker. The mo you usually do the other way around, as you say. He became mm. captain and he started scoring quicker. Again, you do the other way around. So, I don't know. You lose captaincy. Azhar was sacked after the England tour of 1996. Suddenly, he started scoring quicker. People would say he is playing. he was playing rash shots, but he, but he got 300s in four tests against South mm. Africa. So, you can't write that off. You can't write off some of his shots, but you can't write off 300s. The other thing I want to mention is, and we, I, because he's a forgotten cricketer, because better batters have come after him in India and more success has come after him and the match fixing, he's a largely forgotten cricketer. But the other thing is, I would say that as a first slip fielder, he's about as good yes. a first slip as I've ever seen. I mean, him and Ross Taylor seem to see the ball so much before any other first slips. Um, I, you know, there's been some great first slips in cricket, but those two seem to just be always in the right position. And he was also, he was one of India's other, well, I suppose Kapil Dev was a great athlete as well, but he was one of India's first great athletic fielders as well, wasn't he? They had yes. been very skillful fielders in India before, but he wasn't just a skillful fielder or just an athletic fielder. He was a combination of both. He could do everything. He was like, it's kind of like a taller Ricky Ponting. He could feel in the circle, he could feel that bat pad, he could feel in the deep. These are from his early days. Then he, once he became captain, he started fielding at slip. And even when he was one of the stars of world cricket, he was out there in domestic cricket for Hyderabad, practicing over 100 catches every day. So this surprised VVS Lakshman, but Azhar just uh, told him that he, this, this has been the secret to his success. There was natural talent, of course. But he never compromised on that hard work. And 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 this particular partnership, it was. Um, and by the way, I have looked it up. Muhammad Azharuddin was one centimeter taller than Ricky Ponting, so I was right when I said he was a taller Ricky Ponting. Um, uh, you know, the other part of this partnership is obviously obviously Sachin Tendulkar. Where is Sachin Tendulkar at this stage in his career? I was, I'm trying to sort of picture. Um, I mean, he's well beyond you know making that hundred against England and making his debut against Pakistan and. Um, and, and the runs against Australia, isn't he? He's, he's basically, at this stage, it's him and Brian Lara with sort of Steve Ward just behind them, aren't they? Is that, is that the era we're talking about? Or is it just before yes. then? No, uh, this, was this was, see, uh, Tendulkar and Lara went side to side, but the one problem, one complaint against Tendulkar was he never got those giant scores. Tendulkar's first double hundred came very mm. late. 
uh, Lara was getting that two, was getting 277, then 375, then 501. Tendulkar was not getting those giant scores, but Tendulkar was getting the runs. Tendulkar was getting hundreds. Uh, what happened in this year? And Tendulkar's hundreds, the problem was, unlike some of Kohli's hundreds, Tendulkar's hundreds often came in defeats because India were not a great side. Mm. India didn't have a great, a great fast bowling unit. They had Srinath but not a great unit. So, Tendulkar scored uh, 100 in, against England uh, at Edgbaston six months before that. He scored uh, 120 odd in a tote and when the rest of the team got less than 100. But that remains a forgotten innings because India lost badly. So, uh, this one also is not remembered as one of Tendulkar's greatest innings. So, this was a problem Tendulkar had, but if you look, take out the team results, if you look, simply look at what Tendulkar did, and I'm not, I, I'm, I mean, uh, one thing I do not like is combining format, but just by sheer runs, uh, during this period, uh, between, I mean, the last four or five years of the 20, 20th century, Tendulkar was significantly ahead. He just pushed himself ahead of Brian Lara. If you look at the ICC rankings, Lara had that head start. But if you look at the ICC rankings, Tendulkar and Lara were uh, fighting for that number one spot throughout this five years five years span. So, yes, I mean, uh, and Lara had those, those massive series that came from time to time. For example, uh, the 2001 series in Sri Lanka. Lara scored 688 in three tests, I think. That series has no parallel. I mean, I don't think that series has any parallel about how to play Modli. Tendulkar never had, never scored 500 in a single series of mm. any length. But he had those, had too many 300 plus series. Too many of them. I mean, that is one characteristic that Tendulkar always had during this period. There was another thing that Tendulkar lost the number one ranking and then he started again at in the second half of the 2000s and scaled back to number one again after a 10-year span. You know how the number ICC rankings work. One, once you drop out of the top 10, it's very difficult to reach that number one spot mm. again. But Tendulkar did that after a 10-year gap. That, I think, is something that means. Another thing is Tendulkar... Uh, these hundreds kept coming. Uh, this hundred on the next, uh, he had scored 192. He scored 100 in 2001. He scored 200s in 2011. He has a very good record of uh, in South Africa. In fact, Tendulkar has a 40 plus average in all 10 countries. That is something very di difficult to achieve over a 24 year career. Yeah, I, I mean, and I, this one. I would like to think doing it in one country would be difficult for you or me, but <laughs> to do it in all those countries, certainly a little bit tougher. The, the other thing I found interesting here is the fast bowling aspect. And uh, you talk about how Muhammad Azaruddin wasn't always respected because he wasn't a great player of, of genuinely fast bowling. And that was obviously one thing that Sachin was always quite, quite good at. It was like he was born to face very fast bowling. Something we don't talk about a lot now, but it's still there in the background almost all the time, is that Indian fans still don't respect their own players a lot if they're not brilliant against fast bowling. Whereas, in truth, as you and I know, there are players who are brilliant against spin and players who are brilliant against fast bowling. That's a normal thing for test players to be. But people don't do that. And I think a lot of that goes all the way back to the 1950s. And was Azharuddin maybe one of the... Uh, he wasn't obviously the only one because Ganguly certainly had problems with fast bowling. But was Azharuddin maybe one of the last people that didn't quite conquer fast bowling in the way that India fans were looking for, or as the next generation really did? Um, I suppose. Uh, uh, I mean, that was not only the fans. I mean, the senior cricketers also held that against Azhar. Azhar was severely criticized yep. after the 1989 tour of West Indies. Azhar didn't do well. He was criticized. But then Azhar had these strange performances that defy, that often defied logic. Because, see, India went to Australia in 92. It was a terrible tour. And then there was, uh, Azhar did, Azhar was in terrible form. But in Adelaide, India were chasing 371. They were down and out completely. 
and then Azhar suddenly brings them back into the game with a hundred. India lose lose by just thirty seven runs, and that too happens after a few strange umpiring decisions. So I think after not a, yeah. No. Not in Australia, surely. I think Jan Chappell or someone said on air, "If that is out, then I am a Dutchman," or something like that. <laughs> Lucky it wasn't Dirk Nattis; yeah. that would have been confusing. So, and, and, and that's one of the other interesting things in this particular partnership is that uh, they are facing Pollock and Donald, aren't yes. they? And as you said before, it's five five incredible bowlers. You know, one. You know. Um, Paul Adams and uh, Brian McMillan and Lance Kalusner are sort of there and thereabouts, but just Pollock and Donald on their own is an incredible bowling lineup. And so it must, it must have been something, especially on a wicket like Cape Town, for Azza to stand up there. And also, it wasn't, uh, that's the other thing I want to talk about this, this partnership. It's not just about standing up, they blitzed yes. Pollock and Donald, right? And they absolutely smashed them everywhere. Um, and that again is—it's almost like another step in the development of Indian cricket, isn't it? It's we can face fast bowling. Oh no, we can't just face it. We can dominate fast bowling. Yes, I mean, uh, toward, if you watch the video, the towards the end of the innings, Azhar played a, a shot of Donald towards leg side. It was so outrageous. I've never seen Donald look so exasperated. Almost, it had how can you do this to do that to me kind of look on his face. I mean, you're not supposed to do that. It was it was an, a short show, so outrageous. It uh, and remember, none of the none of the two got out to actually a bowler. Azhar was run out. It was a bizarre run out, and Tendulkar got out to an incredible catch. So, I mean, uh, neither was a bowler's wicket. So, and the bowlers mm. absolutely had. I mean, you could see that. They had taken 15 wickets for 224 runs before that partnership. And then suddenly, a bowling attack of that kind was left clueless. They, they, they didn't know where to bowl to e either of them. Even, uh, Tendulkar was still playing, what, do you, what, do you, what would you say, what you would say, conventional shots. But Azhar was simply, he was simply creating shots out of nowhere. If there was a mid-off, he was hitting it past the mid-off. He was not even trying to avoid him. And what was the relationship between Sachin and Azza like? I mean, you sort of, you wrote about it a little bit. I, I don't, I, I was trying to think back to the 90s. That was kind of before we knew every single emotion of every Indian cricketer because of blogging and Twitter. Um, and so I don't remember that much about their relationship, but you do cover it in the book. Um, not much. I mean, see, most of it is, most of it was speculations. We read things on the media. Others, uh, uh, we read on the media that the relationship between the two was not the greatest. Uh, a lot of it, I feel, today was exaggerated, but maybe not all of it. It is, I mean, it is very difficult for, to separate the truth, the facts from what was made up from this pre-internet era. I mean... Yeah. These are things you won't spot on a scorecard. As much as you try. Yeah. But, it didn't but they, were, they, were very, they were very different human beings, though, weren't yes. they? Yes, yes. Yeah, it, it, I, it's, it's fascinating, that, that, that whole dynamic. Um, I want to broaden it out just a little bit from, from those two there. Um, this game, you have Muhammad Azaruddin and you have Hansi Kronje. Perhaps two of the most infamous captains of all times, and not so much for you know how they captain, but for match fixing. It, incredible to look back and think about that the fact that they were going about their business and we were largely unaware. Yeah, and the funny thing is they never led in the same test match throughout yeah. their careers. Probably Which for I, the, probably for yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, probably for good. Otherwise, they both would have declared on zero. <laughs> We would have had a test match where no one batted. Yeah. A tie. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, no, go. Sorry. No, no. See, uh, oh, talking about bowlers and Kronje. Kronje has a surprisingly good bowling record against India. He does. Yeah. And, he, uh, he was not. Uh, uh, Tendulkar once told, I mean, he, I didn't know this. I found out recently in an interview. Tendulkar once told Kronje, uh, 
whenever when Cronier came on to bowl, Tendulkar asked him to take himself away and bring Alan Donald back. He was so uncomfortable against Cronier. This sounds unbelievable, but Tendulkar himself admitted to this. So, in your book, do you and you've now you did you go guys go back and watch this innings ball by ball? Uh, whatever is there on YouTube. And whatever yeah, I was able to reconstruct from newspapers and everything. And we both of us saw the match live. So this is my question. We have two of the world's most famous match fixes in that game. You've written a, lovingly, a loving book about how brilliant the game is. Do you think there was any fixing in, in any of the matches that you watched for your book? You can't fix a partnership like that. <laughs> Not the partnership. Obviously, we, uh, you, you can make a partnership like that. but. I mean, it's an honest question. If you've gone back and, and, and relived that, I mean, there has to be a part of you that is, if you'd gone back and watched that without knowing anything, you'd go with it completely clean slate. But you can't do that because you're a cricket historian and one, probably the best cricket historian in the world. So you have to go back and look at this and don't make that noise. Um, you have to go back and look at this. There must have been a part of you that was like, I wonder. The scorecard seems fantastic. The batting is too good to make up. That is how I would put it. I mean, really, you can't uh, can't do that. I mean, you can't. I mean, this this partnership, the video is too good to make up. Mm. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, is that? But there oh. are. But uh, uh, interestingly, some test matches sound really fantastic. I mean. I don't know. I mean, consider Botham's test match at Headingley. I mean, after all these years, it has been 40 years now. It's 40 years now. How did that really happen? Hmm. Sometimes I, yeah. uh, I mean, you are almost just managed an innings defeat and then you score, go on scoring and then there is that bowling effort So from Bob Willis. So, you actually have to watch the videos and convince yourself, no, okay, this is too fantastic to make up, actually. Well, the funny thing is you have actually, of course, picked the test match there where there was betting on the game uh, yes, and, and yes. that we're aware of. So, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if you give me subliminal messages now at this point, but I like that you did that. One of the other things I like about the book, it's a really interesting book. You've written it, it's almost written in a blog style. Of it, like a conversation between uh, the two of you together, and then with little little bits of facts dropped in, and and in occasionally interviews and other bits dropped in. I re- but I really liked it, and, and that's why I, one reason I asked about um, Azar and Cronier being in that test together. But there's like lots of other different things um, that you brought up as well, like things that I'd forgotten, like Robin Jackman. So Robin Jackman was a commentator in that series. Mm-hmm. And you go back and, and follow the full history of Robin Jackman, who was an English cricketer who was taken out of Guyana because the Guyanese yes. government was so upset at him um, because he often went to South Africa to play cricket. There's lots of yes. little like asides in this book, isn't there? And you, you've been able to hang a lot of cricket history on one incredible partnership that a lot of people have forgotten. Yeah, I mean... Uh... That is, I mean, South Africa, see, the, there are two things. It was an abnormal society until the ni- early 1990s. That is, we know. But exactly what happened in South Africa, exactly the extent of what used to happen, uh, is probably not a very well documented, was not very well documented, at least for Indians. Uh until the early 1990s, the Indian passport carried the message for admission in all countries other than Republic of South Africa. So it was like that. And India were so strong. So the South African government, I don't think, allowed a lot of information out of South Africa. And the Indian government's stance against racism was very strong. Remember in 1974, India reached the Davis Cup final. And the final was against South Africa in South Africa. And instead of touring South Africa, India gave a walkover. India have not won a Davis Cup. Yeah. 
That but is, they still gave a walkover. That is it one was of the most strong stance. Yeah, that's one of the most incredible things in sport. That that particular Davis Cup. I don't know why it is not talked yes. about more. Why on earth South Africa were playing the Davis Cup in the 1970s is beyond me. And then the fact that India um, get into the final and give up their chance to win it. it to me, it's one of the most remarkable things that, that has ever happened. And the fact that it isn't talked about more. So I mean, they do have this intertwined history. Um, you also have Gandhi's relationship with South Africa as well. Yes. And then on top of all that, there's this other guy watching this innings. He he was there, wasn't I? I'm not, not mistaken. Yes. I forget his name. He's from, I think he, he hung around Cape Town for a long time. Was it Nelson Mandela? Was that the guy? Yeah, I think that's the one you're talking about. And the point is, he, uh, it, uh, until lunch, it was, a, it was normal cricket. And uh, he met the cricketers at lunch and suddenly... This happened. I mean, this explosive partnership happened. You almost get the feeling that, I mean, Mandela inspired them. I I have heard, you see things like this in movies, that the presence or a pep talk of one person uh, changing the, altering the course of a match completely. But to watch that happen in uh, real life, it almost gives you... The feeling that maybe the some of the movies is true. Did did it's, do we know if Mandela said anything like, "Come on, boys, <laughs> whack a couple of rounds"? But uh, hey, uh, why don't you bring? What, what, uh, why don't you bring out your slogging bat, Azza? Yeah, uh, yeah, he had a slogging bat. You know that, right? Yeah, Azza had a slogging. Don't, don't forget, in the nineties, most of the senior players had a slogging bat. Do you remember yes, that was yes, like a thing? Yes. Someone would like, I remember both of them being one of the first ones I ever remember, like getting to a certain point in an innings and then just suddenly, oh, he's bringing out, he's bringing out, they always used to say the lighter bat, didn't they? Yes. It was always the lighter bat. And it was never a lot. It was just a bat that they would swing harder. But that was, a, that was now all the bats are slogging bats. Yes. And, but in the 90s, actually, the moment they asked for the slogging bats, we knew, the spectators knew, okay, now the fun is about to happen. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I, I really enjoyed this. Um, I want to get back to your original point because it's something that you and I have talked about a lot uh, through our work and, you know, occasionally to each other when we're being frustrated that we can't find something that we want to find. But that whole idea of, you know, one of the, I think one of the reasons I got obsessed with early South African cricket was because I knew a lot about early Australian cricket and I knew a lot about early English cricket. And you're like, well, things happened in South Africa. Like, who is Jimmy Sinclair? And, you know, there are all these guys who seem to have the same name as each other and Aubrey Faulkner and the leg spinners and, yes. and all those sorts of guys came out. And then you could say the same of the early West Indies um, uh, history is incredible as well. Uh, obviously, early India, early Pakistan, early New Zealand. You and I have both written about New Zealand. Mm -hmm. It's it's incredible. I, I, I mean, if, you, if you're not playing against Australia or England, as you said, it's almost like it didn't happen. I mean, one of one of the when I was researching my book, I realized just how little was written about Garfield Sobers and um, Hanif Muhammad both passing three hundred within in the same Test series. So one guy batted for longer than anyone's ever batted before, probably, and the other guy made more runs than anyone ever made yes. before. And there's not a particular amount of good first person reporting from no. that. I'm assuming. Not many Pakistani journalists went. There weren't a lot of West Indian journalists who travelled because they usually just did their home tests. And you see that over and over again in Test cricket, don't you? Yeah, I mean, India, West Indies' tour of India in 1949, it was a one nil series. Uh, the last test, I mean, you if you go through the scorecards, you'll recognise a pattern. Vijay Hazare and Rusi Modi batting again and again. I, I mean, a week scoring 100. And then Hazare and Modi giving it back. That happened test after test after test. So it was a fan it was a great series. Only one produced a result, but it could could easily have been three nil or four nil. Then uh, uh, there was there is that Bert Sutcliffe innings. I mean, that would have been I don't know. It would have. It should have been everywhere had one of had had England been involved in that series. Yeah. It should have been everywhere. Because see, ten years later, Cowdrey walked out with a plastered hand but didn't face a ball. I mean, uh, we saw how much coverage that one got. Because it happened in England in front in Lords. So that got tremendous coverage. I mean, 
these series uh, in the early 1960s new zealand towards south africa south africa led 1-0 new zealand made it 1 all south africa made it 2-1 new zealand made it 2 all so you don't these are these are exceptional series and these don't happen every time but mm. these don't get written about i mean yeah, you'll get you, maybe one book but not not more than that yeah and and it's also just so many so much of cricket memory so i think i can't remember if it was uh you wrote this in in the book but there's so much of cricket memories that are what we can remember from replays and from live footage and also from the the, the written stuff that has happened and so there's a mm. lot of incredible test cricket that was played well basically 50s 60s 70s and 80s which doesn't exist anymore just because it wasn't covered correctly, it wasn't written about very extensively, and there was no video or or not a lot of video that was packaged of it, and so it just sort of disappears, doesn't it? And that's one thing you you know you and I as um, historians notice a lot. There are some cricketers who just disappear, and no fault of their own, absolutely incredible players, and they just their legacy just sort of dissipates, doesn't it? Because they didn't make runs at the right time against the right teams. Yeah, I mean, uh, see, one of the re- consider. I mean, I'm considering an Englishman, Dennis Amis, fantastic cricketer, has a tremendous record, but he is not hailed as as uh, not regarded as highly as some of his contemporaries because he didn't do well in the Ashes. So he he even he was born in the right country, he got the runs at the right level, but not against the right op. opponents so it didn't matter so see so your book sachin's uh, legacy is obviously fine he'll be okay people will probably keep talking about him uh nelson mandela he seems to be doing okay as well he doesn't need any help yeah, from you to... muhammad azruddin right you have it's probably other than the book uh, or that or that movie that they were going to make on him which would have been by his friends There isn't going to be there isn't going to be that much written about Muhammad Azharuddin over the next 30 or 40 years because better as we said before better Indian cricketers have come uh the Indian team is completely changed uh he was involved in match fixing he was also a politician and not everyone's you know some people love that party some people do not love that party as yeah kind of happens with politics Where do you think where, where do you think his legacy will will end up? Will he will we just forget what a pretty batsman he was because of the match fixing completely? Will he continue to remain as a part of, as a part of the conversation or as Indian cricket goes he'll just be almost taken out of the record altogether? Um I think I would this is I mean us our generation uh, will remember him because we watched him live. so a lot of others legacy has to do with uh, watching him live but after um, decades later when the this generation i mean newer generations will come up they have not watched other lives they have um, heard of him as a fixer but then again over the past few years icc has named several others so this is getting slightly more attention i mean others actually you know this right there 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 was never any concrete evidence against us yeah unlike kron so who confess so even that but what i really would like to like for everyone to see is others i mean the even if one ignores the youtube videos <laughs> uh basically i mean he played 99 tests he scored a lot of runs but uh, there were patterns there were hun- there were ordinary performances but there were hundreds in all countries he was a genius but he was an incon- inconsistent cricketer and whatever happens they can't take away his runs and hundreds uh, that is very true and you can read all about them in sachin and azar at cape town uh, thank you very much for coming on the podcast thank you